Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Catherine Blackwell. I'm the head of the Faculty of Engineering's Industrial Liaison Office, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this talk this afternoon by Dr. Kieran Wood. As you may be aware, this talk is part of our Faculty Research Showcase, which is running all this week. The purpose of this event is to demonstrate the breadth of research capability that we have within the Faculty of Engineering at Bristol. We'd like it to provide a stimulus for conversation and hopefully future collaborations. Thank you very much for joining us today and I really hope that you find the talk interesting and thought provoking. I'm now gonna hand you over to Kieran and his talk is going to be on drones in dangerous places. Okay, I shall start the share. So hopefully you can all see that and thanks for coming along to my talk. I'm Dr. Kieran Wood, as already introduced, and I work at the University of Bristol in the Faculty of Engineering. And my work and research focuses on unmanned aerial systems or aerial robotics, um, colloquially known as drones. I quite like the term drones, actually. It seems uh, to cover all for all of the different types of uh, unmanned flying things that are now in existence. I'm a senior research associate uh, working uh, under a different, a, a few different projects, but primarily uh, employees to conduct research uh, for nuclear applications. There we go. Uh, so some of my background, I have a background in aerial robotics. So I completed a master's in aerospace engineering, then continued on to a PhD in aerospace engineering. This, uh, the PhD uh, focused on the indoor navigation and stability of uh, small drones using onboard visual cues. So how can the camera on the drone itself be used to tell where the drone is and make sure it stays in the same position in a room? This used these, uh, the, the, the two drones shown, quite small vehicles, basically no, not much more than toys at that time. Uh, but moving on, I then had a year out in industry where I worked at Augusta Westland Helicopters down in Yeovil. There, I was in the flight control department and I was responsible for designing and evaluating uh, feedback controllers to basically make a full size helicopter act a bit like a drone in some ways. Following that, I returned to the university and started a number of different projects focused on aerial robotics. Some uh, looked at uh, actuation for gust alleviation, some looked at sensing for uh, actually gust, gust tolerance as well. And following that, I had a, a longer term project working in the nuclear robotics group, but that's also allowed me to focus on um, some volcanology work as well, which you'll hear a bit more about later. And that's gradually increased the size and complexity of the vehicles I've been working on. So uh, moving up from the sort of toys, we're now into custom built octocopter multicopters, which is the, uh, the black spidery looking vehicle in the center. And then there's a fixed wing twin prop UAV, which I'm holding in the bottom left there. So I work within the Bristol Flight Laboratory. This is a relatively new group within the faculty uh, and it focuses on all things drones. There are four principal academics in the group and they have a really wide range of uh, uh, interests over uh, aerial robotics, so uh, unconventional sensing, actuation, trajectory planning, machine learning, um, traffic management, bio-inspired aerial vehicles, uh, morphing structures, uh, electrical systems design, um, really just about everything there is. The lab has access to some fantastic facilities at the university. Um, so there is the flight lab itself, which is a space we use to uh, calibrate, build, cut, chop, actually create the drones themselves. Uh, the wind tunnel labs, we can perform characterization tests to work out the aerodynamic efficiencies and coefficients, for instance. The BRL indoor arena is actually a cooperation between the University of Bristol and the University of West England, where there is an, a tracking arena. So basically, there's a set of cameras that look into this space. And by placing some special markers on the vehicle, we can actually get the 3D position. So you can think of that a bit like indoor GPS. So we can do testing in a relatively confined, safe environment. And then finally, the outdoor test facility is uh, actually a sort of a uh, piece of farmland owned by the University of Bristol, but we have set it up uh, with a small airstrip to allow 
drones to take off and land. And it's recently had some investment to undergo a bit of renovation inside to provide lab space. So actually we can have researchers there a bit more permanently. Uh, check us out on the social media if you want to see more of what we've been up to. So what am I going to be talking about? So drones in dangerous places. So there's a problem and it's faced by scientists and governments and lots of different industries, which is um, ideally there are lots of measurements which would benefit from being collected a lot closer to the source or a lot closer to some sort of hazard. Now I've highlighted two here, like the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine. It's highly radioactive. It's not a place you want to be sending people on a regular basis. And then uh, volcanoes, volcanoes, well, especially active volcanoes, um, you don't want to be sending people anywhere near on a regular basis. However, understanding uh, some of the measurements from them is key to both hazard mapping for local populations and then for the airspace and the air traffic management, particularly big eruptions, when ash plumes can actually have an impact far outside the country of origin. So we have a great solution. We can use aerial robotics. So drones are unmanned aerial systems and so unoccupied even. So there is a significantly reduced human risk with sending these uh, devices into the danger zone. They can also potentially get there faster because they can just cross over very difficult terrain. And uh, what, another great benefit is more frequent access. So. Um, being able to perform repeat measurements to detect change is also of great interest. So some of the engineering challenges um, faced to sort of achieve these sensing missions, um, we have structural design, we need to make sure the drones are strong enough and able to withstand the turbulence and conditions uh, considering volcanology. Maybe um, there's a requirement to have all weather capabilities, so not just making measurements on pleasant days. What happens if the data set needs to be made on every day, so dealing with thunderstorms or particularly strong winds? Flight path optimization. This comes up a lot with collecting large data sets at long ranges. So what is the best way to ascend to high altitudes to make the best use of the battery? So what we really want to do is maximize the amount of time spent in the, the measurement zone as such. Um, collecting useful data. Sensor integration, there's a lot of sensors that exist for full-size aircraft or laboratory size or tabletop um, laboratory equipment, but miniaturizing this and packing it all into a drone, which might only have, any, only have a payload of one to five kilos, actually requires some clever thinking on how to ensure the sensor still provides accurate and reliable data, but is light enough to actually be useful. Post-processing aerial data is something I've uh, come up against in a couple of different topics. Um, because the measurements are made offset, some uh, from the ground, that tens to hundreds of meters, sometimes that offset can actually introduce problems, or not problems, biases into the data itself. So understanding those biases and then being able to remove them afterwards to recover the ground truth is another really important development area in using aerial vehicles for measurements. So field operations as well, something University and the Flight Lab has a lot of experiences with is actually using these vehicles in anger in operational deployments. It's, it's, it's not trivial to travel to some locations with drones and operate, um, especially in places where there's no power or internet or running water, as you'll see a bit later. So I'm going to highlight some work in the Chernobyl exclusion zone and at Manam Volcano in Papua New Guinea. So starting with Chernobyl, um, you may not may not remember, there was a nuclear accident where one of the nuclear power plants uh, exploded in 1986. This resulted in a very large fire which uh, released a lot of radioactive contamination into the atmosphere. This then fell out onto the ground as nuclear fallout in a, in a pattern which was primarily dictated by the wind direction. So looking at the bottom right image, you can actually see there's this east-west plume um, coming from the Chernobyl reactor in the direction of Boryakovka. In uh, the aftermath, there was an exclusion zone set up around this area and that still exists to this day with checkpoints and guards. Um, and the area is still very heavily contaminated. 
immediately after the accident, one of the primary ways of getting uh, or assessing the radiation distribution from the fallout was actually flying people in by a helicopter. They would jump out, pick up samples, take measurements, jump back in, back in the helicopter and fly away. And this had to be done quite rapidly because radiation dose is cumulative. You can, uh, you can either take a lot of radiation for a short time or a low amount of radiation for a long time. So obviously being able to do this a lot required a lot of people or putting people in a greater hazard by you know, sending them in or more often maybe they should. So we have UAVs. If UAVs can replace the need to fly people in with helicopters and take the measurements, then we are uh, reducing that risk. They can also potentially uh, take, take more measurements uh, or more automatically depending on the center integration. Um, they certainly don't necessarily replace ground measurements. They are complementary. Drones generally can't take soil samples, although there are some developments in that world. Um, they can't uh, conduct uh, clippings of uh, plants, for instance. So they're there to augment the current capabilities rather than replace. They can be extremely rapidly deployed um, with the right setup. There's a lot of solutions out there now which are one uh, sort of turnkey solutions. You can just get them out of the case and push go and the drone will fly itself and collect the measurements. That's definitely something we have great ambitions to improve on the flight lab across all remits is greater amounts of automation. Drones might also allow for a higher spatial resolution. Fixed wing aircraft helicopters have uh, limitations on how low they can fly um, to avoid trees and be, be safe from that point of view. But drones can actually get down in between structures and down below uh, tree height, for instance. Therefore, they can collect measurements which otherwise wouldn't be possible. So what are we detecting? Why, why do we need to go and sense uh, radiation? So there are three types of uh, ionizing radiation. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha really only travels a few centimeters in air, beta maybe a meter, but gamma radiation can travel hundreds of meters through the air. So if we're operating drones over a contaminated area, the gamma radiation being emitted by the radionucleotides in that area will be detected by the drone flying over them. So we went to the Chernobyl region a few times, um, primarily the primary primary data was collected in May 2019. And we went there with a few different vehicles, which are all very complementary. So we have the Titan fixed wing drone. So this is a drone which can fly about 16 meters per second, and it can um, cover a very large area, um, flying at approximately 50 meters altitude. The M600 is a commercial, oh sorry, the Titan I should say was home built, well, built within the University of Bristol Flight Lab. So it's not a commercial product you can just buy. The M600 is a product from a company called DGI. It's a large multicopter. This allowed us to carry heavier sensors. So for spot inspections, we could do a low and slow inspection to collect and augment the, the wide area data collected by the Titan. And then finally, the Mavic is a small commercial drone, which is only uh, capable of carrying a camera payload, which is built in. And that's very useful for something called photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is the process of taking a lot of different images of a structure or an area and then you can process them into a 3D model. So you can actually get terrain models showing the height and the trees and the structures um, all with 3D coordinates. And that's part, an essential part of the post-processing. So, yep, they're playing, good. So the fixed wing radiation mapping, we can see a video in the top left, uh, that's the onboard view. In the distance, you can actually see the silver um, Dome, that is the new safe confinement around the destroyed reactor. And the area below it, as you can see, is looking rather unhealthy, and that is known as the Red Forest, and it's an area of particularly high contamination. On the uh, top, uh, sorry, on the bottom left, we can see the results of the radiation scanning. So the flight paths are this sort of back and forth lawnmower pattern. As you can see, there's this sort of band of higher radiation, which is the red dots along the center and then going either side of that plume, east-west plume we talked about, um, actually the radiation then drops off. Well, this was a really great result because it basically um, validates our technique as being able to sort of match up with existing results. Complementary uh, data sets, the, the 3D data can come from LIDAR and photogrammetry. So the top right is showing 
a LIDAR model of a contaminated building. So this is using lots of uh, individual distance measurements coming from a, a LIDAR pod attached to a drone. And then you can turn that in 3D models. And then I've put together a, a set of photogrammetry images around the same structure. quite a challenging area it's not really got any infrastructure so it was essential to have a VTOL type vehicle in this case a short takeoff and landing so that VTOL is vertical takeoff and landing so the Titan could be hand launched oh, let's go back on and play them again so the Titan could be hand launched this allowed it to be uh, just carried out into the middle of any field and we could just throw it into the sky and it would very very rapidly ascend above the trees and then the parachute recovery allowed us to place it within regularly within an area patch of ground about 20 meter diameter maybe uh, which was ideal so in may 2019 uh, we used the vehicles and performed a lot of surveys over 10 days so between all the different vehicles we actually had them in the air for about 24 hours total uh, that was 10 days of actual operations and as shown by the flight paths that are appearing, that's about 16 kilometers uh, squared of area mapped. I do actually think this could be done a lot faster, but this is the first time we have been, so there's a lot of uh, lessons to be learned as well. So looking at some of the results, what uh, the, the sort of leftmost image you're seeing there is, is a processed rad map of the area. I haven't put the units on because that is <laughs> still a, a question to be answered, but the redder, the more intense the radiation. So you can see some of the roads and structures in the top uh, 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 right of that image, and that's where the power plant is itself. So as expected, the closer to the actor, the more radioactive it is. But unexpectedly, there's this little spot down at the bottom of the south, south uh, edge of the area we surveyed. This is identified to be this uh, contaminated structure, which is shown in the central image. Uh, and this warranted further investigation. It actually prompted a whole new line of uh, research of how to post-process this. So we'll see, you see the image is this sort of broad hotspot. And it's broad because one of the problems with aerial data, especially aerial gamma data, is that uh, gamma doesn't have a direction. It's emitted in all directions isotropically. So it's, and it can't be focused using a lens like uh, traditional uh, visual imagery. So there's no way to know if a particularly strong signal is because you're directly over it or if it's off to one side and double the strength, for instance. Um, it, there's no way of resolving that from a single measurement. However, we do know the, the, the laws of physics that this gamma attenuation follows, namely the attenuation in air. So that's like air actually stopping and absorbing gamma on its way to the sensor. And then the inverse uh, square law is basically taking account of this isotropic nature that actually any particular emitted gamma ray can happen in any direction. It's not necessarily they're all going up, for instance. So one of the novel pieces of research uh, just, just about to be uh, submitted actually, so right at the cutting edge, is by combining the visual terrain model, which is 3D information of the lay of the ground, and the geotagged aerial gamma intensity image, we can actually uh, run that through a, an algorithm which is, uh, increases the resolution of the ground map. Now what, I want you, this is all a lot of pretty pictures, but I'll draw your attention to the, the left uh, activity map shows that hotspot as a broad patch, maybe 20 meters wide with activity of 700 uh, counts per second. As, now that is much broader and much lower activity than the reality on the ground as taken by some ground measurements we conducted. After running it through the algorithm, we see that the, the hot spots are confined to just a few pixels and each pixel in the right hand image is actually a five by five meters. So we've significantly uh, reduced the sort of error or the, the spread of the, the estimate of the radiation distribution. And if you look at the intensity, it's now gone up uh, six orders of magnitude, which is a lot more appropriate uh, intensities for what was actually there. So that's the sort of uh, nuclear aspect of the work. I'm now gonna quickly move on to the volcanology side of things. So this has been a running theme as well. Um, and there's a 
a lot of different applications that have come from this, but I'm going to talk uh, about a few. So why, why do we want to know about volcanic plumes? Well, volcanic plumes contain a lot of different things. Uh, there's some names here. So there's, there's water, there's carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, um, hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen bromide. That's a lot. And then volcanic ash particles. So why is this important? So volcanic ash particles can have impacts on local health when they fall out um, into the local area. Breathing them in can actually be bad for the respir respiratory systems. Uh, the uh, HF, HCl and HBr um, can all be dissolved in water. And since this is a tropical region in Guatemala, it actually can contribute to acid rain. Uh, and then CO2, CO2 is just uh, important for the uh, global changes in global CO2. So one of the main things we're looking at is how do we quantify the sum total contribution of volcanic emissions towards the global rise in CO2 concentrations. So the challenges of volcanoes um, are things like long range. Typically, you cannot approach a volcano or be particularly close to it, even when you're flying a drone. There are exceptions. There are some you can get closer to, but we're looking at long range challenges. High altitudes, um, a lot of commercial drones are only made to operate at lower altitudes and actually have, have maximum altitude limits below the summit of this particular volcano at 3,800 meters. BV loss, which stands for beyond visual line of sight. So this is when the drone gets so far away that actually you can't even see it with the naked eye. This is uh, an interesting challenge because basically everything then has to become automated and we have to telemeter all the information back to the ground using radio signals. I've also put down a challenge of target inter interception. Um, blindly path planning on the ground can only get us so far. So by looking at the sky and thinking, ah, oh, we think the plume's going about northwest, send the drone there. Actually, we'd like to increase the automation of that. So actually, uh, the, the drones will automatically find their, their target. And then turbulent conditions I've already mentioned. These are mountainous peaks and actually the wind fields around them can be incredibly turbulent. There can be significant downdrafts to the point at which drones will actually fly backwards. Even when they're at their maximum velocity forwards uh, relative to the air, they're actually physically moving backwards uh, relative to the ground. Um, which has unfortunately led to a loss of at least one drone. We did go find it, but um, it never got back home because it just couldn't overcome the speed of the wind. Similar to the uh, nuclear sensing, actually, it's not just there's, there's one uh, drone that suits all situations. So there's a lot of different drones for different reasons. Um, we have the fixed wing, which is the, the white Titan vehicle again, actually. It's had, had uses in both nuclear and volcanology. There's the blue uh, blended wing body drones um, you see in the sort of group photo. Um, there's the larger multi-copters um, and then well, large and small multi-copters, which are both shown uh, carrying gas sensors in those cases. So one of the applications is ash sampling. So understanding the particle size distribution from a volcanic plume is uh, important for understanding the amount of ash that's suspended in the air now and, and where it's gonna fall on the ground. So in uh, larger eruptions, this can, uh, ash can actually blanket so thick on the ground, um, it, it becomes more than just a background uh, respiratory hazard. It's uh, just, just complete danger for um, mud flows and the half flows where the ash then mobilizes. So understanding better where it's gonna end up is important. However, to know where it's gonna end up, we have to know what's there in the first place. So we designed and operated this uh, collection mechanism, which when the drone flies through the ash plume, these two little sticky pads, which are actually uh, stubs from for putting directly into electron microscopes, would pop out into the flow, particles would stick to them, and then they would be safely encapsulated back within the drone for return to the ground, and then eventual return to England for analysis. That is ongoing work, and we're hoping to, uh, we have a good set of samples, but we haven't got the analysis finished yet. Uh, gas concentrations, so multi-gas concentrations is the thing here. So it's not just collecting one, we're actually collecting several gases at the same time. And what we want is the ratio of the concentrations. So shown on the screen now is a uh, sort of GPS 
light log of the gas concentration. So each dot represents a position over this uh, volcanic summit, which is uh, one in Villarica in Chile. The, uh, as you can see, there's sort of a, there's a hotter area where the, the gases are more concentrated. Now, to help us, although it wasn't fully automated, we did actually have the gas concentration sort of sent live from the drone to the ground. So we had a, had a fun time having the whole go left a bit, go right a bit, getting better. And then once we found this sort of optimal location, we hovered there for a number of minutes to collect a really good sample. So looking at the time history, this is how the gas uh, concentration sort of pulsed and uh, fluctuated over time. Uh, so we can see there's a bit of an oscillatory nature to the gas concentration, but both the CO2 and SO2 concentrations vary simultaneously. So if plotting CO2 versus SO2, we can actually see that uh, there's, they're, they're sort of linearly proportional to each other. So when one increases, the other increases by about the same amount. Now this is important because we use other remote sensing techniques, such as uh, this is a ultraviolet uh, imaging method to determine the amount of gas, but we can only determine SO2. But if we know the ratio between SO2 and CO2, we can just multiply the SO2 flux by that ratio and end up with the CO2 flux, which is what we're actually after. Uh, okay. Uh, and then another example is, is, is flux mapping. So shown on the image is the uh, Sufria Hills volcano in Montserrat. This is a British Overseas Territory and had a rather large eruption. We can see the aftermath uh, actually on that image there, uh, which wiped out the local town. Fortunately, it was all evacuated, so it wasn't um, it was, it was property disaster rather than a human catastrophe. But the plume generally hugs the ground and by monitoring the plume often enough, we can use it to detect changes in activity of the volcano. So working with the Montserrat uh, Volcanological Observatory, we were trying to develop technology that allowed them to make, take more regular measurements of that plume. Now, currently they use helicopters, which cost a lot of money. They have to come from a neighboring island and it puts people in harm's way. Using drones would solve a lot of those problems or reduce the risk in a lot of those problems. Shown on the right is the uh, uh, sort of example data. So talking through it, we can see there's another sort of lawnmower pattern of similar to nuclear data where we fly back and forth to try and map the area. But instead of mapping the ground, we're now mapping the, the sky as such. And um, it might not be too obvious to everybody that there's a sort of line which defines the edge of the plume where we're going from the low concentrations, the reds, and then suddenly it transits uh, into the greens and the, the uh, back into the reds because it's that's color pattern. Um, but basically we're detecting the edge of the plume which is really useful for doing source emission uh, uh, estimates so we can actually estimate how much gas is being emitted at any one point by knowing how fast and how far it's spreading so this work has as you might tell has taken a lot of uh been conducted in a lot of interesting places. Um, it's really great to do this field work, but it's definitely uh, bred success and ultimately le led towards a rather large campaign involving about 30 uh, collaborators from all over the planet in a campaign called Above. So that is um, sponsored by the Deep Carbon Observatory. And their task was really to try and quantify this, this carbon dioxide or carbon emissions um, from volcanoes as part of the global carbon cycle. So this project, it brought together all different drone teams who are using drones for volcanic gas sensing. So, so, so that, that was sort of the key thing. And it allowed us to do uh, both an intercomparison of the, the data collected, but also an intercomparison of the methods and how we all approach this uh, with one of the main ambitions being uh, trying to standardize the, the methods since uh, UAS drone based methods are, are such an emerging technology um, sort of there's a lot of different people going at it from a lot of different angles and this is a perfect opportunity to get us all together uh, it was a very interesting expedition uh, so this is definitely a very challenging environment so Manama Island is a remote island off the coast of Papua New Guinea um, it has no power it has uh, no running water it's um, got very basic facilities we could use However, we packed up all our drones and we took everything we needed to be self-sufficient, uh, with the exception of a, a generator 
out there with us. And we conducted operations over the course of about a week. And we, conduct, uh, we actually managed to collect some of the, the first data ever from this volcano, um, which would have just otherwise uh, not been possible because it's incredibly hazardous to climb to the summit of this particular peak. Okay, so that's just hopefully given everybody a flavor for the uses of drones and particularly the uses of drones in these sort of particularly dangerous and environmental monitoring situations. So what are we doing to look forwards? Well, we built one aircraft, the Titan, however, operating it and analyzing the flight logs revealed a number of uh, deficiencies and things we think we could do better. So we've actually ended, headed down the idea of building our own aircraft. So shown on the images, uh, what we call Buddy. So it's, a, it's an aircraft that we're hoping to uh, design and build all within the university uh, itself um, to meet our specific needs. So uh, for the volcano sensing, it will be that very long climb. That's, that's unusual and it's slightly outside of the design remit of uh, maybe commercial or off the shelf fixed wing aircraft. And then shown on the top uh, right is a, a truss structure. So this is working with the composites department at the university to try and use novel structures to improve the flight performance of multicopters. So one of the things I mentioned was turbulence and wind resistance. Uh, making a, a structure as light as possible is going to aid with having the greatest thrust to weight ratio. And therefore with that, you can overcome the greatest amount of wind. And so that is a ongoing project. Uh, and then future with sort of sensing. So two of the aspects I'm really interested in are taking, uh, well, one of the limitations of what we've done so far is we're only operating one drone at once. So we can only really observe, take observations or measurements from one place. Now, the problem with that is if the thing we're trying to sense is dynamic, it is changing with time, then by the time we've flown from one side of it to the other, it might have changed. By the time we've, we've sort of flown back and forth several times, it, 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 you know, for instance, the plume direction might have moved, um, you know, uh, 10 degrees in heading. And therefore, we're, we're biasing our results because we're taking time to measurement. And then, so, so one of the things I really want to do is look into swarms or at least multiple aircraft so we can actually take measurements in similar lo no, different locations simultaneously and then uh, uas deployed sensors so another limitation is persistence we typically only get measurements in campaign style let's say so we visit the area we take the equipment collect the measurements and then return but then there is no sensing in the gap in that gap but even uh, even if local institutes have the drones they can't be operating them all day every day so using a drone to take a more permanent sensor into that hazardous environment and drop it off uh, and then designing the sensor for the required uh, sort of data collection and data telemetry as well um, is a really fascinating way forward we're looking into. So I'll leave you with a video of flying over Manam Island in Papua New Guinea and you'll see some of the shots of the summit and the operational area we're working from. But that is the end of my presentation, and I welcome any questions you have at this time. Thank you very much, Kieran, for that talk. Uh, that's pretty impressive uh, footage that you're showing at the end there. Um, there is a question that I'd like to ask. Um, what or how radiation tolerant are the drones? So what is the maximum dose rate that they can uh, they can deal with before they fail? Okay, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't actually know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not particularly worried is the answer I'll give. I don't think they're receiving anything. I, uh, I, I think that's going to make them fail at the moment. I know how I would get the answer because I'm working with the nuclear physics group and they've got a lot of different robotics projects. They work with robotic arms, they work with robotic rovers, they work with um, robotic dogs and because those types of vehicles are on the ground and significantly closer, that group does a lot more radiation hardness testing. So how I would, I know how I'd get the answer to that, which I'd use the facilities they have to expose various parts of the avionics, the drone itself to radiation sources and, and see what gives up first. I'd imagine it would be the flight computer. 
Thank you. And there is another question um, from Peter C. Um, he says, thank you for the great talk. What radiation sensors have you used for measuring the plumes? And how would you go about turning the data into a quantitative result? Uh, so that's kind of a cross question, I think. I'm, I'm sure I've got the best way to answer it because we've got the radiation sensing for the ground and we've got the gas sensing for the volcanic plumes. We haven't got the radiation sensing for the volcanic plumes yet. Um, so the radiation sensors we're working with are commercial, commercially available small detectors. So the ones from this company called Chromec, and they make the GR1 and Sigma 50 detectors. And these are uh, scintillation uh, type uh, or and semiconductor type detectors, if, if that answers Peter's question. Uh, sorry, he meant ground, not plumes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes it easier to answer. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, there aren't that many volcanic uh, nuclear plumes in this world, else we'd all be a, a lot worse off. Um, so on, on the ground, so yeah, we use these smaller uh, commercial type detectors and they're linked in with other electronics to uh, collect uh, complementary data, such as the, uh, the GPS location, the altitude, the vol pitch, your um, temperature, pressure, humidity. So there, every time a radiation measurement's made, one of all these other me radiation me measurements, uh, sorry, all these other measurements are made at the same time and stored at the same time. So because we have the location of when the measurement was made, then we know the patch of ground we were above when it was made. So the simplest map we have is just by interpolating those results directly um, and producing a 2D map of the ground. Now the sort of cutting edge stuff that we're working on is, uh, is further acknowledging this isometric directionality of radiation to basically say, well, we've got this aerial radiation pattern. What ground radiation pattern must have caused that following these particular rules of physics? Um, and those two rules being inverse square law and attenuation due to air. I, I think I'll stop there, but that's, I hope that helps. There's another question for you uh, from Sam. Did you run into any significant barriers with the local CAAs in terms of safe operation of the drones? Um, so we didn't run into barriers in terms of being told no. We ran into like having to go through the process. So at every location we've been to, um, contact has been made with the appropriate National Aviation Authority and we've received the uh, exemptions required to operate in these areas. So for instance, the video being shown right now, um, the Papua New Guinea has the CASA, uh, CASA PNG. Um, we actually visited their headquarters to shake hands with the people in charge to make sure they were fully aware of our intentions and we had the appropriate uh, certifications needed. And then also the NOTAMs, which is notice to airmen. So um, other people operating planes, say for instance, someone had to do a joy flight uh, tourist flight in the area, they would know that we were operating drones. So the, so the, the process takes a lot of time sometimes because of like obviously sort of cultural barriers and maybe it's outside of the remit of what people in other countries have dealt with before, but we always pers persevere to make sure we, uh, we have everything um, I's dotted and T's crossed. Great. Well, we are fast approaching four o'clock, so I will bring the session to a close. Uh, many thanks to you all for attending and for your questions. And Kieran, particularly thanks to you for that really fascinating presentation, making us uh, very intrigued by the um, footage that you're showing now of that uh, volcano. No problem. Thanks for joining me and listening, everybody. So. Obviously we realize that doing a showcase online virtually doesn't um, really allow us to have the interactivity that we'd like and doesn't facilitate conversations. But if what you've heard today or in other sessions during the week have captured your interest, then please do get in touch through the industrial liaison office and we're happy to connect you to the academics and students in the faculty to help continue these conversations. We'll be sending out um, contact details um, for the ILO after the uh, showcase event um, and we look forward to hearing you, hearing from you uh, again. But for the meantime, many thanks again and have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>